In honor of Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, I had watched all the previous movies in the Rise reboot, which are also known to be the Matt Reeves trilogy, but to your surprise, you may find that the first movie isn't directed by Matt Reeves. It's directed by Rupert Wyatt, who unfortunately wasn't able to direct the following sequels due to scheduling issues, but we'll get to that later. But in my opinion, this trilogy is underrated, and I barely hear people talk about these, unless they're diehard fans of these movies, which is kinda sad this trilogy isn't in the conversations of the best movie trilogies out there, but it is what it is. But without further ado, let's talk about This movie is special because it doesn't start with the main character, but the secondary main character, named Will Rodman, who is a scientist studying a way to cure Alzheimer's to prevent anyone from getting it, but mostly to cure his dad who is already dying from it. And during a press conference, one of the monkeys they test on runs away and seems to go berserk. But it is later found out that it was trying to protect its baby this whole time. Franklin, who is one of Will's associates, doesn't want to kill that baby. He leaves the choice to Will. But Will ultimately takes him in to study furthermore. Then we meet the actual true main character of this trilogy from here on out, Caesar. And from here on out, the events of Rise of the Planet of the Apes and the Fall of Humans come true with Caesar growing up and Will having cured his father, but having the disease come back only for Will to want to make another version of the cure. This movie has a lot on its plates to build from the ground up in only 100 minutes, showing the fall of humans due to their own greed and stupidity, to Caesar held in an ape sanctuary and having to become the alpha and guiding the apes to their upbringing and having them rebel. The movie does a good job in telling the story with good pacing. It may seem like a slow burn, but when I sit and watch the movie, I always find myself really interested in how Caesar's gonna rebel against the humans who treat him like garbage. And James Franco's character is actually really compelling too, aside from his girlfriend, who really doesn't have a character aside from being the generic love interest every movie the main character needed. But arguably, this could be one of James Franco's best roles. That makes me wonder, why isn't he in any more movies? Oh, okay. And even though Will is given less screen time after Caesar decides to guide the apes and is trapped in the sanctuary, his presence and fact that he was involuntarily the reason for the downfall of humanity is made clear. But let's talk about Caesar in this movie, played by Andy Serkis who brilliantly captures the movements and mannerisms of a chimp. Caesar in this movie is smaller than any human and ape in this movie. It is made clear by him completing the Tower of Hanori right away, but he struggles with figuring out who he is and what place he has in this world. He knows he's not human and that he is an ape, but he can't act like one or else that would be frowned upon. And for the whole movie, he struggles on what he should be, whether or not he should whether or not he should please his dad Will, or be himself and do ha as he pleases. But the moment is finally made clear in a subtle way when Will's dad passes and Will wants Caesar back. Caesar notices the leaves on Will's hand and decides to stay. And to some further unfortunate later events, he decides he's had enough of Draco Malfoy and finally decides this is the time to rebel and makes a powerful moon in a powerful scene. What does he do? He grabs Draco's hand and shouts, Pour off me, you damn 38! All the other apes are shook. Follow, but follow Caesar as they finally make their escape and go after Steve Jacobs in the facility where the drug was created. Following the third act, we see how the apes fight against the humans to their eventual freedom. And after we've seen what the humans have done to apes, we kind of root 
for the apes in this last third act. Even though we're watching our own downfall. And what's interesting is that Caesar doesn't want to kill the humans. But just wants to live peacefully with his new family of apes. A mindset that eventually bites back at him in further entries. We last see Will finally get to Caesar, begging him to come home. And all Caesar says is... And Will accepts he can't do anything to change his mind, ultimately leaving Caesar to be free. And so the apes all go to climb the trees, swinging away off to the sunset, while humanity is on the brink of collapsing. This movie can be a slow burn, but picks up quickly and is honestly my second favorite of the trilogy. Because of how good the story is, and the script, and the CGI is beautiful for 2011. Is really mesmerizing. Living in a modern world where blockbusters just have rushed CGI and rushed production. But let's leave the rankings for later because we can now move on to the sequel. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes came out in 2014 when this beautiful gem came out. Holy shit, it's Freddy Fazbear! <laughs> FNAF! And it surprisingly does not bring Rupert Wyatt back after exceptionally directing the last one, but brings Matt Reeves, the GOAT, into the franchise because Rupert's ideas didn't match with what the studio wanted. But anyways, let's talk about Dawn of the Planet of the Apes. Dawn of the Planet of the Apes picks up a whole 10 years later after the simian flu that was caused by A113 and Rise was exposed to Franklin in the first movie. After an attempt test on Cobra, another ape from Caesar's tribe who will be really important later in this movie. That simian flu became a wide pandemic which wiped out most of humanity causing most of humans to get sick and die and only a few to adapt and survive. And honestly, watching this after having to go through a pandemic in the real world a whole 6-7 years later after this movie was released, hits too close to home. But we're met with an older Caesar who is more experienced, has a family, and since 10 years have come by, all of the apes have not seen any humans in quite some time. That is, until two apes run into a couple humans, and one of them kills an ape, and C Caesar shows up to the humans' hideout after following them with his whole tribe, and he tells them to stay away and don't come near. They don't want trouble, just peace. But of course, the main human in this movie named Malcolm confronts Caesar, begging, begging them begging him to leave them to work on a generator that could help power their whole fortress and after that, agree to leave the apes alone. Ultimately, Caesar decides to help them and let them work, but when Koba, who was one of the apes from the last movie, who would get tested on, finds out about Caesar's plans and decisions to help humans get back on their feet, starts to lose trust in Caesar because his whole life he was tested on and treated like garbage by humans while Caesar was treated the same way while he was in the sanctuary, but had ultimately been raised by Will Rodman, who showed Caesar compassion and empathy for life, while Koba was never taught that, so Caesar in a way is more human, and Caesar's wife is sick, but Malcolm's wives help her with giving her antibiotics, so Caesar begins to trust these humans more, and ultimately Koba betrays Caesar, but not for the good of the tribe, but for himself. He shoots Caesar and frames the humans, so he convinces all the other apes to start a war against the remaining humans and Caesar. And Caesar is rescued by Malcolm and his family, and is taken to Will's house, who is presumably dead. Caesar stays there a couple days max, I think, to rest, and he finds a video of him as a baby with Will. The conversation between him and Malcolm is just so endearing. Caesar finally gets back in his feet and is ready to go face Koba, who has the humans hostage and has everything in control, while 
also killing or holding the loyal apes to Caesar captive. Caesar confronts Cobra, making it known to, any to everyone he is still alive. Malcolm tries to convince Dreyfus, who I haven't even mentioned, is played by Gary Oldman brilliantly, and acts his ass off in a fairly underrated role, who is the leader of this group filled with remaining humans. Malcolm tried to convince him that Caesar is the leader and he's no threat and he'll make all the apes leave them alone and go their separate ways. But it's too late. Dreyfus reveals that they have found a military base on the north side and that they're on their way and blows himself up and the whole place leaving the remaining Caesar and Cobra while fighting this whole time to fall with the collapsing building. Caesar ultimately lets Cobra fall to his death and becomes the Alpha again with now the remaining apes having to find somewhere else to live. While the human story never really gets resolved, we can assume they're killed off with the military team that's coming their way in the next movie. And while this movie ends in a bad situation, it leaves the door open for a sequel, which we're going to talk about real soon. I want to talk about Caesar and the other main characters in this movie. Caesar in this movie goes through an arc about thinking that apes are better than humans and how apes wouldn't make the same mistakes humans have made before. No ape would hurt another ape, but Koba is the opposite embodiment of Caesar's ideology. Well, after what Koba has done by killing other apes and trying to kill Caesar and ultimately starting a war, Caesar realizes that they are no different than humans and can still make the same mistakes humans have committed in the past. While Malcolm wants peace with the humans and apes alongside Caesar, Dreyfus is kind of like Koba but is still very distinct because it is shown that Dreyfus cares about he cares more about his own people while Koba cares more about himself in his own image proving it by killing Caesar's lowest followers and stalling said war out of his own interest and trauma. Dreyfus is willing to sacrifice himself and blow up the building to kill all apes to leave his people alone and has the best interests in his people but does not trust Caesar and the apes. This movie is exceptional at showing how humans and apes are so similar to the point that they can't even make the same mistakes we can. They are no good guys and no bad guys in this movies, and you can sympathize and relate to both sides. And the movie does a wonderful job with the script that makes you care for both sides, but also can see where both sides may be wrong. Anyways, this movie is really underrated sequel, and I'm surprisingly had a lot more to say about it than I originally thought, but all good things have a beginning and an ending. And with that said, the conclusion of the Planet of the Apes trilogies. We finish off with... Now, War for the Planet of the Apes is the finale everyone has been anticipating for for years. And to my surprise, I feel like I have less to say about this entry. But, at the same time, more to say about it, because the story in this is basic, with it taking two years after dawn, and Caesar still having to deal with the consequences of Koba's actions. The military group that Dreyfus in the last movie have called is now in control of the area where Caesar's tribe lives, and is actively hunting the chimps. And we see that some monkeys have sided with the humans to our dismay. And even though some of them are with the humans, they aren't exactly treated the best. But that's not surprising as humans only see them as dumb animals. But the colonel happens to kill Caesar's son, the Blue Eyes, who was introduced in the last movie as one of Caesar's kids alongside Cornelius. Thinking it was Caesar he killed, Caesar attacks the colonel, but the colonel cuts the line he's hanging from. From here on out, this becomes a revenge movie, 
and an escape movie, with Caesar wanting revenge on the Colonel for what he did to his son and the other apes while Caesar was away, and an escape to free the, ensla the enslaved apes that got captured while Caesar was gone trying to look for the very same person who ran into his tribe and captured them. Feeling the guilt of his son's death and the capture of his tribe, Caesar slowly loses who he is and his compassion he has shown in the previous two films. And can we just talk about Caesar's growth and how he can now talk nearly identical to a human being? I did not start this war. The ape who did is dead. His name was Koba. In this movie, we're shown more of Maurice, Rocket, and Luca, who have been here since the first movie, but I haven't really talked at all about them up until now because in this movie, they shine the most as the secondary characters. This movie is 90% ape, 10% human, which shouldn't work, but it somehow does because the apes are just as expressive and the story makes you care. But Maurice is really goaded in this movie, and even Rockin, as he was the first ape to bully Caesar in the first movie, only for him to be one of his most loyal friends, and in this movie we are introduced with Bad Ape, or Green Eyes, depending on where you lie in the fan base. But Ban Ape is an interesting character because he was never a part of Caesar's tribe or even a part of those apes that got tested with the AZ-113 drug in San Francisco. So it makes you wonder, what else is out there in the huge world they live in or what, animal, what other animals might have been infected by the drug? But Bad Ape in this movie is the comedic relief. And this is a character that shouldn't work in the serious drama of a movie about apes and oppression. But it works because his lines come off so naturally and beautifully played by Steve Zahn. His performance in this is subtle and natural. Oh no! <coughs> Why so small? <coughs> Let's talk about the antagonist of the movie, the Colonel, played by Woody Harrelson, who is really intimidating in this movie. He serves as the driving force for Caesar to go off hinge and he makes the apes build a wall because he knows there are other people coming for them and he's scared. He doesn't care about the apes at all either and doesn't take them into importance because his goal in the very end is to beat the virus that got everyone sick. And to, and to survive whatever forces might threaten them. He teaches us that the A113 virus that killed the world left the ones that could adapt to survive, but in return, it slowly makes them more primitive and animalistic, like removing the ability to communicate and what makes them human. That the virus that almost wiped us out the virus that every human survivor still carries had suddenly changed, mutated. And that if it spread, it would destroy humanity for good this time. Not by killing us, but by robbing us of those things that make us human. Our speech, our higher thinking. Nova is an example of what the Colonel was worried about and how humans will lose the ability to communicate and so on. But Maurice carries that empathy that Caesar is losing slowly. Well, the other apes point guns at her. Maurice is the only one who takes empathy in her and takes care of her. And I love the scene where she com she's confused whether she is an ape or a human. The audience knows she's a human, but Maurice tells her what can, argue, what can arguably be the truth as well. She is Nova. She is her own self 
and no one can tell her otherwise or put her under any category. It's a beautiful scene with a subtle message about identity, which these films have carried for the last three movies. I want to take a minute about Michael Giacchino, who made a beautiful score in this movie, in my opinion being the best out of the three movies. I mean, just listen. It's triumphant haunt heartfelt and it's just a privilege to listen to. He's written many good scores, such as also The Batman, another directed Matt Reeves movie. But anyways, the other military army arrives and Caesar leads the chimps to escape alongside everyone else leaving humanity to ultimately destroy themselves in the end, with the colonel offing himself and the remaining humans celebrating their victory only for an avalanche out of nowhere to finish them off, leaving Caesar and the other apes to finally be in peace and find the promised land they've been looking for for the past three movies. Just like Moses, who led everyone to the promised land but couldn't enter it, Caesar has his final conversation to Maurice, and Maurice always being there by his side, we finish Caesar's story in a bittersweet ending, with the apes all happy for their new home, but Caesar dying, to the wounds he endured throughout their escape, leaving the future to the hands of his friends and family. In conclusion, I'm glad to have witnessed this absolute triumph of a trilogy, and these movies need more recognition. I'm excited for Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes, which appear to be more aligned with following the footsteps to the road to the 60s Planet of the Apes movies, and I've seen interviews where this era of chimps is considered to be in their bronze era. These movies have so much to tell about humanity, and what it means to be truth to yourself, and how you can inspire others to do the same. I don't really know how to finish this video. but if you liked it, please consider subscribing as any show of support would mean the world. And I will be later reviewing Kingdom of the Planet of the Apes after it comes out, so stay tuned for that. But now stay crisp, guys, and I'll see you. I'm gonna take a nap because I'm tired. <sighs> <sighs>